Kia ora tato, everybody. Uh, Bruce Arrell is my name. I'm the director of the Good Valley Unit and the current head of the Department of General Practice and Primary Health Care at the University of Auckland. Uh, my, it's my great pleasure to bring to you the topic of relative energy, relative energy availability in sport, a diagnosis to pay attention to. And our two speakers tonight are Dr. Megan Ogilvy, who's a general and reproductive endocrinologist with a particular interest in energy deficiency in the athlete, menopause, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and gonal dysgenesis. She works at Fertility Associates and Auckland District Health Board. Megan has been part of WISPA, a high performance sport New Zealand medical advisory board since 2017. And we've got Mr. Dane Baker, who's a performance dietitian who has worked extensively with New Zealand's elite athletes and teams currently Blues, Super Rugby and New Zealand Football. He's also part of WISPA, um, the group uh, looking at optimising female health and performance, and is working with patients suffering from RED-S fertility issues, osteoarthritis and diabetes. So we'll find out what RED-S is tonight and hand over to you two. So thank you very much for working with us. Right, thank you very much for that introdu introduction, Bruce. That was very kind. I'm very pleased to come to talk to you about this tonight and thank you to the Good Fellow Unit for inviting us to talk. This is a subject that we are all hearing more and more about and it's now the most common diagnosis that our reproductive endocrine group are seeing in reproductive age women. And I'm really pleased that we're going to talk about it. So this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to explain to you what that, those terms that Bruce just reeled off there mean and how it all fits together. Talk a little bit about why we're hearing about this and why I'd love you to be making this diagnosis. Show you some prevalence data think about how to diagnose this condition and some management tips, and then talk a little bit about education. Then I'm going to hand over to Dane, who's going to talk about the dietitian side of this, and then we'll have some questions at the end. So this condition all sits around something called energy availability. What underpins all this diagnosis is lowered energy availability. And I show this slide to my patients and I talk to them about the fact that the body takes all the calories that you give it every 24 hours. And then I tell my patients that the first thing that comes out is anything that you make an active decision to do. And for our young schoolgirl athletes, that might also involve walking between classes, getting to school, as well as all the training. And our adult patients who are no longer at school, that can involve all their physical activity, as well as their training. What's left over is what the body doesn't make a conscious decision to do, and that's your energy availability. And that runs several things. That runs your reproductive axis, and it's why we see these girls and women presenting with menstrual dysfunction. It runs your ability to stay warm, your gut function, your ability to think clearly and lay down short-term memory, and your ability to protect your bone density. And what the research clearly shows is this isn't an exercise problem. This is an energy availability problem. So exercise with appropriate fueling doesn't get our athletes into trouble. So what do the terms mean? The terms can be muddling, and it's really helpful to understand a bit of history behind these terms. So in 1997, the consensus statement for the female athlete triad was first published, and this represented a number of years of research and work. And initially, this was published in the lower left hand side of the screen here in the red area, and it composed three things. The lowered energy availability with the slide I've just shown you, lowered bone density, and a lack of menstrual cycle. And then over the rest of the 90s, the more fluid nature of this model became appreciated, 
And it became understood that women could move up and down this continuum of this model at any time as they became sicker or they achieved recovery. And then in 2014, the International Olympic Committee attempted to rename this condition, Red S, or Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport. And there's now quite a lot of controversy between these two groups. There were two real positive things about this consensus statement. The first is when you look at this model here on the slide, there was a real attempt to start to recognize the more multi-system nature of this condition. So the red triangle is maintained with the triad. There's a lot of research behind the triad and it is really important. But also there came an understanding that every single system in the body is affected by not being well fueled. The other positive about this uh, consensus statement was it was the first time that men were recognized as also presenting with energy deficiency. Up until then, we had to tell men that they had female athlete triad and it was never particularly well accepted. And then in 2019, the athlete triad group came back and presented the male athlete triad. Now you will hear Dane and I talk a lot this evening about women, and it's because we have a lot more uh, research in women, we know more about them, and we see a larger number of female patients with this condition. But undoubtedly it's present for men, and Dane and I have had several cases of men that we have worked together to help recover from this condition. Men tend to present either with sexual dysfunction or fatigue or a drop in athletic performance. Those are the common presentations. Sometimes men can present wanting fertility and pregnancy and sperm counts can be found to be low. In New Zealand and probably actually across the Western world, these presentations can be quite complicated by the fact that many men have visited men's clinics and been given testosterone, perhaps in a way an endocrinologist might not prescribe testosterone, or they've purchased illicit substances at the gyms or fitness centers that has changed testosterone less, uh, levels for them. But certainly men get loss of bone density and probably men need to be exposed to more severe energy deficits for longer to become unwell and possibly they have faster recovery than women. But actually, in fact, we need a lot more research to understand what is going on with men. And the athlete triad group have now changed their model as is shown in the bottom of the slide here to include reproductive suppression and dysfunction rather than a lack of periods. So let me show you some prevalence data. I made the comment at the beginning of this talk that this is now the most common diagnosis that our groups see in reproductive age women. And it certainly is, but this gives you somewhat more of uh, an objective statement. So this comes from Catherine Black, who is at the University of Otago, and she did a cross-sectional survey to recreational athletes. So this went out to gyms and fitness centers. And to qualify for this study, those women needed to, meet, to be meeting the World Health Organization guidelines for exercise, which is doing at least 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise. These women were surveyed using the LEAF-Q, which is a validated questionnaire looking for energy deficiency in women. And it questions things like menstrual periods, gut function, uh, energy, food intake, and so on. What this showed is that almost half of the women surveyed were at risk for LEA. And usefully, I think, are the following points, because when you're asking women, it's useful to know what to ask them to decide how at risk they are. But for every hour of exercise per week added on top of the World Health Organization guidelines, the risk of falling into being at risk of LEA increased. For every injury in the last 12 months and for every day off training because of the injury, the chance of being at risk doubled. 
all girls that presented with stress fracture were at risk for LEA. It was difficult to know anything about periods because of the large amount of hormonal contraceptive use. And other data has suggested that this is more of a concern in our recreational and schoolgirl athletes than in our elite athletes. And that would also be our experience. The elite athletes are typically somewhat better supported and don't get into quite as much trouble. Okay, so how to diagnose this condition? Well, I think there's um, several things to work through and think about. The slightly tricky thing is that there is no diagnostic criteria for this condition. So you kind of have to have a nose for this condition and, um, and a high level of suspicion. And you're thinking about risk factors, you're thinking about stressors, and you're thinking about outcomes when you're talking to, to, to men and women, but I'm gonna focus on women for a moment. So what you're looking for with your athletic patients is weight change. I, I don't see a, cut off, a BMI of 20 as a cutoff for excluding this diagnosis. We see many women specifically, but also men with BMIs of greater than 20 getting into trouble with this condition. You're looking for dietary changes. Is this person suddenly starting to miss out food groups? Are they doing that in a healthy way? Are they missing meals? How much disordered eating is there? And I'll talk about disordered eating on my next slide. And also what's happening with training, is training changing? So have they suddenly decided they're going to start to train for a marathon, Ironman and so on? And is the fueling appropriate for that? Psychological stressors are absolutely part of this as well. And both the energy availability and the psychological stressors come into the hypothalamus and then decide whether the hormones are going to be released or not. So stressors and psychological stress are really important. I make all of my schoolgirls list out everything that they do beyond their academic studies and their training, and the list can often be long. I had a young girl say to me last week, I can't remember what else I do because there's so many things. But our adult women are also at risk of having far too much on their plate and understanding that is important. For um, us, for our group, we get girls most commonly presenting with either delayed menarche or menstrual change. But the sports physicians most commonly get this presentation with recurrent musculoskeletal injuries or recurrent stress fractures. And if you start to see this, this should now raise your red flags for this condition. The gut symptoms aren't really being diagnosed quick enough. It's very, very common for our athletic patients to present with an irritable bowel syndrome type picture. Very often, these um, athletes have seen dietitians prior to seeing us, and they've gone through exclusion regimes, low FODMAPs, and so on. And of course, all that is really doing is decreasing the amount of calories going in and increasing some of the food obsessions and food concerns. Anxiety and mood change and brain fogging, lack of short-term memory, it's fascinating the way these symptoms often come right as periods start again. And a fatigue, and an inability to recover from training sessions like an athlete's peers should also raise your red flags around energy deficiency. So this is a spectrum of presentation and understanding where your patient sits on the spectrum is really important for two reasons. One is it tells you what sort of help you want to get for your patient with your multidisciplinary team. So Dane is great for the athlete that is just inadvertently under fueling and some of the disordered eating. But when you get down to women who fulfill the DSM-5 criteria for an eating disorder, you are better getting a dietitian who's really got experience in managing eating disordered uh, patients and helping them recover. 
The other reason why it's important to understand this is it will give you a heads up as to how much anxiety you're going to have to think about and watch for as, the, as you help this patient recover. So the athlete that is just inadvertently under fueling doesn't really understand the amount of calories he or she is putting out on a daily basis, is probably very busy, and it's hard to actually find the time to fuel that much, and they're just not keeping up. The DSM-5 criteria for an eating disorder most of you are aware of. The disordered eating is a somewhat more abstract uh, statement, but the kind of things you're looking for are uh, absolute rules or rigidity around food. I get girls come in to show me the photographs of their food that they're, they're photographing and uploading to their social media account it means that there's quite a large amount of food obsession, a real preoccupation with healthy eating, starting to miss more than one food group and clearly using diet pills, laxatives, binging, purging, all of these things should make you concerned about energy availability. Okay, so what are you going to look for after you've taken your history? So you do need some objective data because you need to be able to follow that person and, and really have some objective data as to whether they're getting better or worse. And I would repeat my statement that you cannot exclude this diagnosis just because you see a BMI of 20 and you think or above and think this person must hit the healthy range not necessarily, and it doesn't exclude this diagnosis. The differential diagnosis here is a pituitary lesion because typically when you get the hormone levels back, you will see a low estradiol level or a low testosterone, often a low LH. Typically FSH levels aren't suppressed. Somebody needs to be very eating disordered to suppress the FSH levels. But of course, the differential diagnosis to that is a pituitary lesion. So for doing a pituitary screen and then a screen for all other causes of a lack of periods is important. You could consider whether you want to do a pelvic ultrasound scan. The most useful reason for a pelvic ultrasound scan in somebody with secondary amenorrhea is actually to understand about the endometrial thickness because you may remember that's the most estrogen sensitive tissue in the body. And if somebody hasn't had a period for nine months and they have a two millimeter endometrium, that woman hasn't seen much estrogen for most of that time. So it can give you quite a lot of information. A, a bone density could absolutely be considered and typically about six months of estrogen deficiency is needed before we start to see changes in bone density. But a bone density can also add strength to your argument as to why recovery is important. And you can consider the place of a pituitary MRI scan. I don't do an MRI scan in all my, all my female patients. I tend to do them in my men because I think that the presentation is not quite as clear always. But if you've got a very clear clinical history of periods going as weight drops or food changes, and the blood tests look absolutely typical, I'm not sure that you're adding much by doing a pituitary MRI in that situation. So this is what happens to the hormones. You wouldn't have a talk by an endocrinologist without looking at some hormones. You can see here the energy balance that comes in from that very first slide that I showed you. And this works in the hypothalamus alongside the stress. And there's no formula here. This is different for every woman, how much of this is an energy balance problem and how much of this is a stress issue. And there's almost certainly genetic predisposition. We don't really understand much about that at the moment. But the hypothalamus then uses this information and decides whether to release GnRH or not, which is a permissive hormone down to the pituitary to release FSH, LH, and then estrogen, or testosterone from the testicle. And this diagram shows quite nicely why the differential diagnosis is a pituitary lesion. And then typically, I do monthly hormone levels to help women see as they recover. And if FSH starts suppressed, that will normalize first. Then LH normalizes. 
And when you see estradiol levels of about three to 400, you'll almost certainly see menstrual resumption. I would draw your attention to the risk assessment tools that are out there. This one is the female athlete triad assessment tool, but there is also an, a red S one, it's called Red's Cat. It's freely available on the internet. And this gives you a way of quantifying severity for women. These aren't available for men. They're all about menstrual function. So it's not very useful for men, but it does give us a way of quantifying risk. I find this helpful if I'm trying to convince a woman as to the fact that she actually is quite significant with this condition or convince myself. And I also find these helpful if I'm dealing with quite a high level athlete and I'm trying to justify cutting back on the training. Okay, so management. I think the most important thing is that if you can possibly get a multidisciplinary team involved in helping your patient recover, you will get recovery faster and you will get better recovery at the end of this journey. And getting a multidisciplinary team that has experience and is skilled in helping athletes with this diagnosis is just so important. Recovery will take time. It will take your time and the patient's time and it will absolutely take emotional energy as well from both of you. I think it's really important to be very clear with your athlete at the beginning as to how long this is going to take to get better. And I would estimate that Dane and I probably would work with athletes for an average of two years to get them healthy again. So it does take time. You need to sell your story. You need to explain that for the very athletic patients, their athlete performance will improve. The data shows improvement in performance with adequate and appropriate fueling. And for the more stressed, perhaps academic young woman, her cognitive function will also improve with better fueling to the brain. Think about the addiction spectrum, the addiction to exercise and the addic addiction to perhaps disordered eating is absolutely an addiction. And just like a smoking addiction or an alcohol addiction, it needs help and support to help people manage this in a way that is healthy for them. You can't just tell somebody to gain a bit of weight and then see them in a year or two's time. You need to see them regularly and support them. Monthly hormone levels are really important. It can often take nine to 12 months of normal energy balance to achieve menstrual resumption. And without the hormone levels providing good feedback, you can feel like you're working in the dark. Don't forget to advise contraception for the women specifically. As these women get better, they will become more fertile. And for some of them, contraception is really important and share the resources that I'm about to show you on the next slide. So basically, overall, the aims are to be liberalizing nutrition, make sure there's adequate nutrition, minimize the calorie output as much as you can, and address the anxiety that all of these changes will bring about. And a few sessions with a psychologist around anxiety management can be invaluable. So this gives you a concept of length of time of recovery. And that's why I really like this slide and why I've included it. So if you have somebody who is inadvertently under fueling, you can often turn around the energy status quite quickly actually within weeks to a few months and get good response. If there's concerns around disordered eating or body dysmorphia into that, that can often take quite a lot longer. We need to hold the positive energy balance though for a number of months to see improvement in menstrual status. And then improvement in bone density can take years. And it's the bone density really that I am so keen to pick up our schoolgirl athletes because those girls are reaching their peak bone density in their teenage years and early 20s. And whether those girls meet their genetic potential or not, 
without estrogen around over that time. We just don't know the answer to that and what their potential to recovery is through their 20s and 30s, the research really doesn't tell us. I think we're much better off picking these girls up early and trying to help them at a younger age. So there's some really good resources out there, and I would encourage you to talk to all your athletic patients about this diagnosis. Again and again, when I pick people up, when they haven't had a period for a year or so, I hear the athlete or sometimes their mom, if they're younger, say to me, nobody ever told us about this. We just didn't know that this was important. So I would urge you to talk to all of your athletic patients about the importance of good fueling and adequate fueling. The No Period Now What resources are fantastic. I encourage my young girls to be following Nicola Rinaldi on Instagram because she posts about the importance of body positivity and having healthy periods. WISPA is a high performance sport initiative. Uh, healthy women in sport are performance advantage. And we have a website that has some good resources on it and will continue to build resources over the next few months. Science of Sport Podcasts has done a really good podcast on energy deficiency. Katie Schofield is also part of WISPA and she's done a really good website and her blog on her website talks about her journey with energy deficiency. And then the International Olympic Committee and the Triad resources are also available open access on the internet. Right, Dane, I'm gonna let you take over now. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dane Baker, uh, performance dietitian at Axis Sports Medicine and I'm also um, nutrition contributor to the WISPER team. And I'm also a professional fellow at the University of Otago. I've done a little bit of research in this area. So I'm going to talk to you more about the concept of energy availability and going in a little bit more detail around how that works with nutrition, um, a little bit of the science behind how energy availability works, and then showing some examples of how we might use that with athletes. Um, and then I'll finish up with some practice tips about what to look out for in a, in a similar vein of what Megan's um, talked about. So hopefully this is cool. So with low energy availability, many of you um, might have seen these uh, information or I guess the how female athlete triad has progressed from the early 90s to sort of the mid 2014 here. And the constant theme here is this concept around energy availability, and that's progressed there into energy deficiency. So we know nutrition and fueling plays a key part in this. And I guess the key thing here is what we're talking about with which some patients kind of go looking for the magic bullet is, is we're essentially talking about energy. So calories, we're not looking at sort of so much around the nutrient deficiencies, which obviously will occur when we're energy deficient. But that's our main area is, is looking at how we can optimize that, that energy availability. And this has been um, yeah, detailed in many um, consensus statements. And we can see here that energy availability underpin, underpins the concept of REDS, which is essentially what REDS stands for is relative energy deficiency in sport. So when I'm talking to athletes or a patient, I often talk about why they? Why we need to eat? Why do you think we need to eat? And I guess in sports nutrition, many, many athletes or many sports teams, we often educate around the importance of, of carbohydrate to fuel the muscle, especially if we're doing more high intensity exercise or, or longer duration. That's that's pretty well known. And we also know about the importance of protein to help our muscle repair and regenerate and adapt to the training stimulus. But also, really importantly, our body needs energy for essential processes, which, which Megan's talked about. And we sort of talk about this as sort of the energy to, to keep the lights on in the body. So our body needs energy for our key processes, such as reproductive health, cognitive function, cell maintenance, thermoregulation to keep us warm. Um, and also these processes here, so bone, immunity, and protein synthesis. And it's no surprise that a lot of this research is, is focusing on in recent years is the performance aspect. And especially when we think about our goal with uh, training is to essentially build new protein. 
that our whole training responses is built around this concept of protein synthesis. Um, there's good evidence to show that um, athletes are more prone to, to missing training with illness when they have low energy availability. And we know quite clearly through the female athlete triad, um, the risk of, of stress fractures is significantly increased um, in those with, with menstrual disturbance. So what is energy availability and sort of how do we work around that and what, what does it mean? Because we often hear this term energy availability. So I'm going to talk a little bit around the calculations and how it works. And then what I'll do is, is make this nice and simple with food and show you some of the, just the strategies that we talk about with athletes, which, which ultimately comes down to just good fueling. And if we're achieving now sports nutrition guidelines, most of these are, are taken care of. But as we know, there's a lot of social media influence and body image concerns that, that can put our patients in the wrong direction. So what energy availability is, it's a little bit different than our classic energy in versus energy out. What we're talking about is how much energy from dietary intake, from food and drink, we minus the cost of exercise, and that's the energy that's available for key functions in the body. And so how this can change for an athlete, just like to some of us, we might have trained for half marathon, a marathon, is that just like our training is sort of periodized across the week, we might have days where we train twice or longer trainings, is that our energy intake also needs to be periodized across the week. And that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to do with performance nutrition um, for our elite athletes, for anyone that's looking to get the best out of the nutrition for training. But this also becomes really important for, for athletes and especially adolescent athletes as they progress through adolescence, you think the classic sort of swimming program, they will start to add more and more sessions as they progress, or it might be personal interest that they just start exercising more. And if we don't make our adjustments in nutrition, that's when things can go wrong pretty quickly. So it's a little bit complicated, this equation, and we don't need to understand this fully. But what we're talking about is you might see this equation around what energy availability is, how we, how we sort of talk about it or display it as calories left over per kilogram of fat-free mass. So we can estimate body fat percentage pretty easily. We don't need to do any invasive um, measurements in the clinic. And that won't really have significant effects on, on what our energy targets are. So when you see, this is 45 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass. And so that has typically seemed to be where we talk about with, with energy balance, or this is adequate for all energy and physiological function. So that number 45 is, is what we talk about with energy balance. And that's probably a target that we'll definitely be aiming for. Sometimes we go a little bit higher in adolescent athletes because we have that added energy for growth. But that's a target of where we're trying to, to work with, with our athletes or with our patients to recover menstrual function. That's our first starting point. We know that for short periods of time, uh, patients may be able to tolerate reduced energy availability, but this really needs to be well-structured and well-programmed. And we do see a lot of patients for, for general weight loss, and we know that uh, metabolism can easily be down-regulated. So actually, when we're trying to, to safely lose weight and consistently, we don't want to go into a state of low energy availability also, which, which we see many patients for. And it's normally this critical factor of, of under 30 kilo, kilocal per kilogram of fat-free mass, um, which we start to see the significant problems. And there were some really um, nice studies in sort of the early 2000s by Anne Locks, if, if anyone um, is really interested in this work, she's really the, the pioneer, a lot of the, the work around energy availability. And she's done a lot of really well, uh, well-controlled metabolic ward studies where they have a really high level of control. And she's, she's shown even though only after four days of exposure to low energy availability of, of 10 kilocal, that there's significant downregulation of, of reproductive hormones and, and stress hormones. In free living athletes, it's always a little bit more complicated because when we try to assess energy intake or energy expenditure, we do get maybe 20 or 30% of error on, on sort of both sides of those equations. But what we've seen is, is very similar with this threshold, around 50% probability of um, disturbance in obituary woman in 12 weeks. And this is actually really interesting as well. As, as, and that's what Megan sort of touched on. It's not necessarily the low BMI that's always a risk factor. It's sometimes the, the level of energy deficit that they've been exposed to. So you can see over 12 weeks of an energy deficit of 400 to, to 800 calories um, induced menstrual disturbance in a dose-dependent manner. 
And this 800 calories, that could essentially be someone intermittent fasting and stopping breakfast at morning tea, um, which we do often see in the clinic. So these food group changes or dietary strategies can quite quickly um, induce energy deficiency. And when that's combined with a high energy output, which is often the case, you can see why it's quite easy to, to get into a state of low energy availability. So what are some of the risk factors um, that we have? So if we think of both sides of the equation, and I know Megan's touched on these, we'll go into a little bit more detail is we can often see our patients very common with restricted or disordered eating, um, inadvertent under fueling, uh, fad diets and lifestyle, which I'll, which I'll touch on in upcoming slides, and quite commonly that, that symptom of IBS or um, gastrointestinal dis disturbance is, is quite common in our patients that we see, and all this can cause a restricted eating pattern. And on the other side of this, we've got the high cost of exercise. Um, it's also important we, we have a lot of our patients that might be doing um, multiple sports, which can mean something like a, a hockey training going straight into a, a middle distance running training uh, within 30 or 40 minutes. And especially what we're probably seeing a lot more of now is these team sports where there's just a high level of high intensity running, are just as prone to maybe in the earlier days of the research where it was a lot of aesthetic sports, um, ballet, dance sports, uh, weight restricted sports, but we know now that it can affect all athletes of and all genders. Um, training, train, uh, changing training loads. So I guess your classic adolescent endurance, endurance athlete that's starting to progress in their training, you'll see sudden increases in training loads. Uh, the duration of the exercise. So we get a lot of, for example, cyclists doing three or four hours of cycling on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Um, and any sport where there's a uh, pressure on physique is always going to potentially compromise energy intake and energy availability. Also important to think about the the high cost of living activities. So often spend a lot of time asking our patients what they do, walking to school, um, just, I guess, those types of questions. We often can see um, those potentially with that sort of exercise addiction, doing a lot of walking even before breakfast. And those are some of the telltale signs that this, this could definitely be a risk. So if we go into these calculations a little bit more detail, this gives us an example of what they look like. So here we've got low energy availability. So we've got an example here of a 57 kilogram uh, football player. If that player is doing two hours of training, she might burn about 800 calories, say, in that two hours. And that would be pretty normal for a pretty challenging football training. If she's eating 1,800 calories a day, what that means is there's about 1,000 calories left over to her system. And if we did that calculation, that would be 20 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass. And that would we know from years of research, that level of energy availability, there's gonna be a real high chance of, of uh, menstrual disturbance. So what we're trying to do is, is probably get down to this green level. And we know that that's um, energy balance or optimal energy availability. And so what that now means is that same athlete doing the same amount of exercise, now she's eating 3000 calories. So she's got about 2,200 calories left over. So our whole philosophy is no matter what type of exercise they're doing, duration, we're always trying to leave that baseline amount of energy left over to all of those important uh, bodily functions that we've talked about. So I've got another example here of a rower. So at this time of year, we do a lot of rowing talks with our young rowing programs. And this just talks you through sort of how energy requirements will change day to day. So let's say now we've got a 17 year old female rower. So she's a little bit more developed, a little bit older. She's 70 kilograms, more muscle mass. Um, and if we're trying to put her in that energy balance, when she's having a day off, she goes home, she might do a little bit of movement at school. We've got a calorie requirement of about 2,500 calories. Now she adds on that gym session, um, a bit of conditioning, bit of running in there. Now we're getting close to 2,900 calories. And as we start to get in the water, as sort of summer starts to hit or spring, if we were in a lockdown or many in the South Island might be getting into this level now, is that when we do our on-water session, we might get close to 800 calories. This can easily go higher than this if it's a longer training, or it could be a little bit lighter if it's a really easier technique session. So now we're up to 3,300 calories. If we're doing a double session, so we're erg in the morning and on-water in the afternoon, now you can see we get close to 4,000 calories. And rowing is a real classic one because all of a sudden we get athletes going from nothing to this high level of, of um, activity, and that can bring on fatigue quite quickly. And I guess the longer the exposure to this, um, that's when we start to see the effects of health on low energy availability. We also know that within energy day, within within day energy deficiency is important. And this really just explains 
how energy is spread out across a day. And this is a little bit of an intense graph, but basically what it's showing is this, when they do these calculations around time and energy deficiency, so they look at when athletes are eating across the time period of the day, they can see how long in the day they might have been in negative energy balance. So in this study, these were all elite Norwegian um, winter athletes, and they spent a lot of time looking back at the timing of what they ate. And what they found is that these two groups of athletes were in the same amount of energy, um, but one group spent a lot more time in energy deficient, um, in negative energy balance. So they weren't eating across the morning. They might have been poorly planned after training. And what they found is that those spent more time in a catabolic state. Um, they had lower estrogen and increased stress le um, cortisol levels. So one of our key things we're, we're often working on with our patients is the importance of spreading out their energy, recovering, fueling during longer duration sessions. Not only is this important from a fueling perspective, but also um, a hormonal perspective as well. And so we know that fad diets and social influence play a key part. And probably there's never been a, a point in time where there's been more influence around this from social media, from Netflix, from documentaries where we can simply have a patient overnight taking out a whole food group. So these are, these are constant challenges that we're faced with. Um, we did research in 2016, so it's a little bit of a while ago now that we looked at this in our elite athletes at high performance sport. Um, and what we found was that females compared to males were three times more likely to use social media for nutrition purposes. Um, and that we actually found for the recreational athlete, the internet was the main source of their information where at HPS and Z, our elite athletes were actually using performance nutritionists, dietitians, which is really good. But for our patients in the community, that the internet is going to be a, a key focus. So that brings with it a lot of challenges. And we can see here restrictive diets. Um, what we know from restrictive diets is that, especially when we have someone changing potentially to a plant-based diet or a gluten-free diet, we know that this can increase fiber intake. And it, we've seen through research that this increases the, the prevalence of low energy availability, simply because we're taking out the energy density out of a lot of our diet but we're also potentially increasing um, appetite suppression. So I'm just gonna talk you through a quick example now of protein. So that seems to be the food group of choice currently where a lot of people are, are making changes uh, for a lot of ethical reasons and also uh, supposed performance reasons. I'm just gonna show you how things can, can change pretty quickly. So if we look at, if we think about our sort of classic uh, our balanced food model, our, our dietary plate where we might have quarter or a third of our plate of carbohydrates, um, half our plate of vegetables, and we've got our lean protein down the bottom left here. So if we think about a, a normal kind of balanced plate, that might look quite easily around 600 calories. Um, if anyone's had a, a My Food Bag meal, if you have one portion, that's typically what it will sit at. And so we can kind of think of the, the, the calories that we get from protein might equate to about 250 calories, let's say. So within that 250 calories, what I've tried to do here is explain how much protein we would get out of that. So if, if we had 250 calories, um, let's say from chicken, for example, we would eat 165 grams of that and we would get roughly about 47 grams of protein. So that's a really good source of protein. We can see as we go down this graph, we get into our plant-based options and we can still get some really nice servings of protein from our plant-based options for our chickpeas, our beans, um, our tofu. But if we look a bit deeper, if we were trying to get 250 calories and a decent source from our, um, say our legumes, our, our beans or our chickpeas. You can see the portion here is about a one and three quarter cups. And what we often see with a lot of our patients is they're taking meat off their plate, but in no way are they kind of replacing it with this amount of plant-based protein. So a lot of our work with patients looking to change to a plant-based diet is a lot of nutritional education and coaching around how they can balance their plate from a protein perspective but really importantly, this can provide a really important source of energy. So if we have an athlete that's a high level of exercise, this can play havoc. And we also know that appetite doesn't track with energy expenditure. It's, it's normal for appetite to be down-regulated. Um, there's increase is in nausea post high intensity exercise. And one of our challenges we do have is, is appetite suppression. And what we see anecdotally in a lot of our patients is they start to go through the recovery process is they'll tell us that they feel hungry a lot more of the time. All of them are concerned with that, but their appetite is starting to normalize. Megan touched on the, the effects of the gut, and this has been um, shown by Catherine Ackerman's group in Boston, who are one of probably the leaders 
in relative energy deficiency uh, research. And she had a group of over a thousand patients that she screened for low energy availability. And they found a 1.5 greater odds of, of GI complaints with low energy availability. And there's also been research and evidence shown in that in our um, anorexia patients. So really having an understanding that this could present with, and often at times we see the, the GI complaints are at their highest, at their, their lower states of energy availability. So that's also a good cue is when did these uh, symptoms occur? Have they been lifelong or have they been in recent times? So I'm just gonna finish up with some examples of how we might fuel an athlete. So this is an example here. And again, these are just examples of food. So don't feel like these are the best foods to be eating. These are just examples of, of how, how a generally well-balanced diet might meet these energy requirements. So if we think about that athlete now, that rower, if she's trying her baseline day, we can see here, we might have three regular meals. We might have a morning tea at school with a couple of bits of fruit and a muesli bar. Again, maybe a, a yogurt and some fruit after school. And then we might have our classic sort of well-balanced meal at night. And for most people, they're gonna, it's going to be quite hard to underfuel that. And we know that 80% of our adolescent athletes or adolescent patients are inactive and might be at risk of overweight or obesity. So we're really looking at these sort of active individuals or those that are at risk of low energy availability. So as we increase this session now, we might do that 40-minute conditioning session um, in the gym. And now what we're doing for these changes is we might think about taking a snack that we could easily eat after school, something like a bar, one square meal. And now we're looking at finding a consistent recovery option. So we'll often work with, with our patients around finding, and this could be a whole lot. It could be food, it could be milk. These are just examples. And a lot of the time we're working on convenience with our patients. And that's a real key part of this is finding something that's logistically possible when a lot of these uh, school adolescent athletes are at school all day for long periods. And now we might start adding an evening snack after dinner and, and yogurt can be a really great source of high protein, high calcium food to include in our day. So now we're on the water. So what are we looking to adjust here? What we'll be doing, and we do this with all of our sort of fueling plans with our patients, we go in a lot of detail with, with how they can put these sort of meals or snacks together. We might now add a bit more for morning tea on this day, and we might try to add in an extra option with our pre-fueling. And we're keeping our recovery really consistent. So we're making that part of the routine. Because she's on the water for, for 90 minutes, sometimes two hours, we're going to add an a, a additional carbohydrate option. It could be sports drink. It could be food. Typically, when someone's on a boat or they're running, it's going to be liquids to easily digest that. And we know that 90% of people don't need sports drink when they exercise. But our athletes, once they start going above that sort of 60 minutes, not only is that additional fuel going to improve the performance of that session, it's also going to provide important energy source. And we might increase the pre-bed snack. So this now might look like a glass of milk. We might add uh, Milo. There's some nice high protein uh, Milo's that are available now for adolescent athletes. Or again, it could be a smoothie. It could be yogurt with fruit. There's a whole lot of foods that we might eat there. So what about this big day when we're erg and then we're on the water? And this can happen sometimes two or three times a week for these athletes. So now we're really thinking about finding something that's nice and easily digested on the way to training. It doesn't have to be big. And then this breakfast meal. And often at school, this breakfast meal is often the one that gets sacrificed because they go straight to school. So again, it, we, we work with a lot of really easily um, portable breakfast options that they can take. Um, overnight oats, it can be cereal. We might add now an extra chocolate milk to their normal breakfast. And we're trying to replicate everything we were doing on the other day. So we're trying to create an eating regime. And you can see here, there's a lot of food to be eaten. Um, and we know that appetite, is a good chance that that's going to drive this sort of intake. So the more education, um, at the moment, we talk to a lot of schools with their rowing program and, and really having the understanding of, of what this requires to fuel this level of exercise. So what are some of the questions to, to finish up with that you might ask your patients? I guess one of the key things is, is potential intolerances. A lot of these can be self-diagnosed. We see a lot of patients self-diagnosing uh, dairy or gluten. And that we know that with... Uh, reduction in protein synthesis, that probably the gut is just running at a really um, down-regulated way. So sometimes even just keeping dairy out, but over time they can reintroduce dairy, but these can all be triggers to have a look at. Um, have, they, have they cut out food groups recently? Um, sugar, that's always sort of in fashion, often now animal protein, carbohydrates. Um, was there a time recently where they've lost weight? Often there can be a point in time, especially in adolescence, where there was potentially a planned weight loss of five or 10 kilograms. And that is often the trigger uh, for amenorrhea or menstrual disturbance. Or 
We have lifestyle changes. So again, have they shift to a plant-based diet? Are they fasting? And a lot of these pressures can come from parents that are going through their own sort of weight loss journeys and then get sort of passed down to, uh, to our younger uh, patients. And when they combine this with a high amount of training, that's when things can go wrong pretty quickly. Um, and then also looking around gut issues. And then thinking about when we're, for the questions for the very active, thinking about how often they're exercising, are they doing multiple trainings per day? I think definitely once you start doing multiple trainings, the risk significantly increases. And we've seen that with Catherine Black's research. So often with one training a day, we don't have to have our nutrition right and, and maybe we can survive. But once we start training twice a day, that's when things will show up. Um, have we started training for an event or have we started a new sport? That can Does that sport involve a lot of uh, high intensity uh, running? Uh, body weight history, that can always give a bit of a cue as well. Sometimes it's not because we know that this can happen in, in higher BMI, but it is, is relevant just to ask if any, any sort of unplanned weight loss in PRAS, so you're not potentially triggering any emotions around body weight. Um, and do they have any strategies to adjust to bigger trainings? Just simply a question around, do you, do you have any recovery after your training? Do you have any fueling strategy for your longer trainings? And if these are all a no, then you know that there's probably a good chance that they're at risk of low energy availability. I mean, just general levels of activity outside. Um, often we have patients that we know are high risk that are often walking before school. All of these are kind of telltale signs that there's probably some level of exercise addiction. Um, a lot of our patients will do a lot of time on their feet at school as well. It's really common now with big campuses to be doing 10,000 steps um, with a heavy school bag just at school. So that's me. And this is just for our referrals. We're just part of um, Access Sports Medicine. Many of you might refer on there to, for musculoskeletal injuries. And yeah, any information there, you can find more information on, on their website. Thank you very much. Um, uh... I think I have a male patient I may need to send you. Do you see patients in the public system, Megan? Uh, not for this indication, but Susanna O'Sullivan and Stella Milsom will. So you could refer to either of those specialists okay. and get a very good opinion. Okay, you wouldn't be able to afford uh, privately. Okay, so we've got some questions there. Um, there was an issue about contraception you wanted to deal with, uh, Megan? Yeah, there's two good questions about what to do about women on hormonal contraception. And this is tricky and all the guidelines avoid commenting on it. So the copper IUD is really the only thing in terms of contraception that you can assess hormones on. The combined contraceptive pill is able to be stopped. And if you're concerned about energy deficiency in a female patient, you could discuss with them stopping the combined contraceptive pill and using condoms or putting in a copper IUD for three to six months to understand what's happening to periods and hormones. Marina IUD, we've got no normative data for hormone levels on a marina, and certainly probably estrogen levels are a bit lower in the first 12 months than the remaining four years that it's in. But I think that especially in the remaining four years, estrogen should be measurable on a marina, and if it's suppressed, then that is probably concerning, but I don't have normative data to support that statement. And high dose progesterone options make it very tricky. So if at all possible, if you're worried about this, if you can stop the hormonal contraception and have a look, Alternatively, this is also where a dietitian who can give you a good assessment of energy balance is absolutely invaluable because you don't know what's happening to, to reproductive dysfunction at that point and your dietitian can come in and say, actually, this is something I'm concerned about or this person's doing pretty well. Okay, so that's that question asked. Um, uh, got another question there. Uh, is the risk of other musculoskeletal related injury increased or just that of stress fracture? Can you, one of you take that? No, it's all musculoskeletal injuries, ligaments and so on. Essentially, it's about micro injuries and your ability to repair the micro injuries with adequate nutrition. And people who are running an energy deficiency just don't have that. Okay. Um, is there any long-term data on... Um, people who get into the state, like what their, um, what their you know, long-term health problems are? 
So the long-term data mainly comes from women who have had DSM-5 criteria diagnosis of eating disorders, not so much the inadvertent underfueling or, or that kind of um, middle of that spectrum athlete. For the anorexia girls, there are certainly long-term fertility problems and bone density problems. When I look at the Z scores on some of the spines of the red S patients, I really find it hard to believe that we're not going to have real problems with spinal osteoporosis in the future, but no data to back that up. And is there a particular treatment if they're looking like they're getting osteoporosis? What's the, what are the treatments for that? In a reproductive age woman or so in a reproductive age woman, the best thing we can do is get estrogen and get ovaries going again. So there's two reasons why women lose bone is one is the energy deficiency and the other is the estrogen deficiency. So using a combined contraceptive pill just doesn't work in this situation because you're not managing the energy deficiency. So ultimately the best treatment is to manage both. Sometimes if my back's against a wall and there's absolutely no changes, I do use a bit of transdermal estrogen. Estradot might help further bone loss, but it's certainly not brilliant. It's nowhere near as good as getting recovery from this condition. Okay. So we've got um, a link up there in the chat box for the Whisper organization. Um, so... Dane, you're talking about increasing calories by quite large amounts. Is it difficult to get some of these young women to be willing to uh, increase that? They must think that's, you're talking yeah. about 1,500 calories, don't you? I think. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah. Awesome amount of food. It's not easy. And I think that's why the importance of the multidisciplinary team helps me a lot. So often when I see these patients, they've, they've seen Megan or they've seen someone that's really taken them through what they're dealing with and then that makes the the sell of it really important but we try to make it quite sort of science-based and talk them through the energy expenditure that they're using that they're undertaking with their sport rather than me just coming and saying eat this because I think you need to eat it we sort of try to make them understand their energy requirements and yeah and, and it does, does take time that um, that there is a good question sitting in the inbox too about whether we try to just push up food or decrease training or both. And I work on doing both actually for my schoolgirl and recreational athletes as much as I can. Not that the exercise is a bad thing, but actually if you can just create a positive energy balance faster, you're going to get better quicker. And I get numerous numbers of girls who've seen Dane and come back to me and say, that is a huge amount of food. I just can't eat that much. And it then allows me to say, okay, well, let's cut down what is actually going out so that you don't have to physically eat quite that much. But that in itself is often a diagnostic statement, right? I think that's why the um, showing someone what they're expending, it all starts, it's a bit of a process on them figuring out what they don't need to be doing in their day because there's often a lot of unnecessary training that's that's not helping. Dane, you had some nice, um, uh, looks like pamphlets or diagrams of protein and food and things. Are they available on the Access website or? Uh, yep, there is. If, if you look at some of our... Um, uh, the spin, I think it's called. There's there's some articles on there, and if, if anyone, yeah, we can get those that information out to you as well if you need. So the link is through Spitten, is it? Spin. If you go onto the oh. Access website, we do a uh, sort of a, a newsletter every three, three, two or three months with articles, and you'll see a lot of sort of yeah, patient-focused articles around energy deficiency and, and how to fuel and those types of things. Good. I mean, it's very hard. I, my PhD thesis was on. Uh, Ex, um, look, looking at nutrition and it's actually very hard for the average punter to know what's in their food isn't it I mean yep. people, you, you two have access to extra resources but the average Kiwi hasn't got a clue really what they're putting um, into their yep. mouth and the hard part of this is appetite so appetite is can be quite easily suppressed and just down regulated to what the athlete needs to be fueling and that's that's a big part of the challenge Right, okay. Um, any comments on the recovery period to get over the adverse effects of REDS? 
time. <laughs> it takes time. It takes a long time. And it involves um, more work than people anticipate at the beginning. And you really have to work with people to support them. And you will probably lose 40% will go off and talk to other people and try and get different answers from somebody else. And then they may or may not come back. So you certainly don't win with everybody. Uh, but for the girls and the men that you do win with, they get better and they get on with their lives and uh, they're so much happier and healthier. It's absolutely worth it. It seems to me a huge overlap of this group with your eating disorders, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, how do you distinguish between the two? How do you know when we would send someone to you to or someone to an eating disorders clinic? What's, what's the distinctions? What are the red, red flags perhaps? So it depends on how sick those, the, mainly it's girls, right? Those girls are, certainly if there's electrolyte disturbances, they're far better off with an eating disorder unit. If there's active uh, significant purging or if weight is dropping very fast, it's quite strict criteria to entrance with the public eating disorders unit. Uh, but there's also some really good um, private providers out there providing great support too and we often all work together so very often in those girls that are very sick the eating disorder group will get them to a weight that is safe and then we can often take over and go from there so there is a lot of overlap you're right and we will refer on quickly if we're concerned about somebody becoming really unstable or unwell well because I just heard the mortality for eating disorders is like 10% lifetime. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if, you know, if you two just like to have a look at the questions. Yeah. Um, I got, do yeah, you so. tend to involve parents and coaches in your discussions with the athletes? Yeah, absolutely. If, I, most times, especially for adolescents, parents are always there. And yeah, that's, that's really the key. And with coaches, yeah, absolutely. So um, sometimes uh, there's so much more awareness around this now that coaches are starting to get really proactive. So if the patient's happy, I'll, I'll write a letter back and involve the coach um, and the, copy the coach into that. So, yep. Question there from Hawke's Bay. Regional centres such as Hawke's Bay, limited services, are you able to see people remotely? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I think we're all doing remote consulting. And Sarah Bebel, who is also a sports physician, uh, with Access Sport Medicine in Queenstown has a lot of experience with managing this disorder as well and is great for the athletic uh, patients. So she's another one who will also do remote consulting. Yeah, I think from, yeah. Yeah, you do it too, Dane? Yep, I was just going to say, I think 40% of my patients are telehealth prior mm -hmm. to the lockdown. So we see patients from all over the country. Um, I can see there one around Ensure Plus. Yeah, any extra energy is good. Um, but it, you can also have someone having a, a supplement that's still going to be a thousand calorie and sort of energy deficiency. So that will help. But it's also thinking about how the overall structure looks. We had a patient using Ensure for lunch, but everything else needed to increase. Um, so I've got a question there about just wondering how often you might see this in older patients age 40 plus and how, how the treatment might differ. Maybe answer both of them, both of you. Do you want to start with that, Dane? Or do you want yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I don't know the numbers, but I do know it's, it's very popular to see those over 40. So, yeah, a lot, obviously a lot are referred by Megan and her team. And it will just be often sometimes in those situations, the energy availability process is still the same, but you might not be see the high energy expenditure. You might see more of the kind of restricted eating. Um, and often the, the energy gap is not as vast, but it can still be quite challenging and encouraging them. And then obviously weight gain in that population isn't always uh, yeah, that ideal or looked at as the same. And as I think athlete. I would be more anxious about bones in that situation because we just have less number of years to recover. And I probably would be enthusiastic about repeating the bone density as that woman went through menopause because hormone replacement therapy would be likely to be quite good treatment to maintain bone density through uh, at least the first few years of, of the postmenopausal years. Megan, would you like to just um, repeat what you said to me before the show about MRT and uh, testosterone? I, mean, I think it's give a little plug for your um, popular topic. <laughs> 
how enthusiastic I am to have GPs um, back out there prescribing both hormone therapy and androfem testosterone replacement. And there's some GPs out there that are doing a great job, but, um, but I'd love to see more prescribing. On the testosterone issue, we have a very good podcast with Megan on the good fellows, one of the most recent ones we've done. It's absolutely fabulous. So have a look at uh, Good Fellow Clinics if you're not signed up to our podcast. They're all free. Um, so, yeah. Um, so we've got time for more questions. Um, the top, top things for coaches to watch out for in their adolescence. We've been doing some work with coaches around body positivity and um, positive environments in terms of fueling. And we've been really trying to get the secondary schools to work on eating. There's a real issue with the adolescent group who either train before or after school and rush off to first period, shower, get changed, and they just actually forget to eat. And the same thing at the end of the day. So we're really keen that um, Perhaps everybody eats together after the training session or before the training session. You need to be quite wary of the very talented athlete that's working across two or perhaps three sporting disciplines, and they're trying to do everything for everyone. And the other thing we've been asking for is some coordination for that, and perhaps you don't need to do every single training session for every sporting discipline and empowering parents who are often the only ones who see the full picture to actually say, no, that's enough, you've done enough. This is also the group of course that are most into social media and peer influence. And sometimes it can be quite normal with peers to not have menstrual cycles and break that normalization mm -hmm. is really important. Dana, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I think, um often the more we work with coaches and their athletes, one of the key things is simply like recovery eating and that attitude to fueling. Um, also, we, we have a lot of our athletes now that will track their cycles mm -hmm. and that can, that can be some nice feedback that once they have an understanding of, of what that looks like to understand their, their fueling balance. That's a very good point. Encouraging all girls to download an app on their phone from the beginning and knowing when their periods are is really helpful. The, um, the University of Auckland, and I presume some of the other institutions actually have an elite sports person who's meant to link up with some of these sports people. I don't know if you get to see them, uh, any links with them, Dane, but um, so hopefully some of these students do get a bit of a break. You know, they're not there, you know, they, they, they're supposed to get a break from some of their uh, the study demands so um that's yep. just something worth knowing um question here how about atkins keto paleo is this incompatible with the well nourished and fueled athlete yeah i think any diet that takes a food group out is challenging especially around the, the keto and atkins diet there is a there is some actual nice research and sort of by ann locks who's done a lot of this work around um carbohydrate availability and blood glucose with estrogen secretion. There's also a lot of new work going on around bone uh, bone health and bone markers on low carbohydrate diets that seem to think that carbohydrate availability is just as important as energy availability. Um, and a paleo, it, paleo is a bit different because paleo is more kind of meeting whole food. So you can eat quite a well-balanced diet with paleo. But I, I think the more kind of restrictions you have on food and put rules around food, there's a lot of psychological issues that come with that and yeah and it just and a lot of these foods especially paleo you have a lot more fiber in your diet and we know that when you're trying to eat three and a half thousand calories and that's when some of those easily digested carbohydrates become quite important i've got a question for both of you about vitamin b12 um i'm really starting to see it with our people who are plant-based and I've got a man with a low B12, it's due to vitamin B12 for deficiency, but his uh, red cells are fine and he hasn't got, he doesn't seem to have pernicious anemia um, and he's functioning quite well. I mean, do you think our normal ranges for B12 are too high and we can actually, uh, or you know, when do you start replacing, I guess, would be my question. 
Yeah, I, I normally talk through just making sure that they, if they can, they can get a regular blood screen across the first maybe three to six months, 12 months of when they do change their diet and then see how those numbers are and, and work with, with the GPs to, to sort of make those decisions. But we do see a lot of um, really good elite athletes switching to a plant-based diet that's well, well balanced that can easily maintain good levels of iron and B12. So it's, it's really individual. Right. Any comment on that, Megan? Do you see people with low B12? No, I don't see them, Bruce. I don't not, really have a comment on that. Not, not uncommon. No, I've been what, one of the one things, one. yeah, similar to B12 is iron. Um, mm. So iron plays a big role and there's, there's a lot more high prevalence of low iron and low energy availability because of uh, inflammation and increase in hepcidin that we get when we're in a low energy state. So that is also a marker that to look out for. Low iron correlates quite closely with low energy availability. Um, so just got the last question. I don't know if you've got any good residential eating disorder units for a patient refusing all food and being declined admission or NGT, nasogastric tube, I guess that means. It's high postural tachycardia and suicidality. Sounds more psychiatric to me than um, any comment on residential eating disorder units. No, that patient's really sick, aren't they? They need high-level medical and psychiatric yeah. care, right? Okay. We're pretty close to 8.45. Would you, you two just like to sum up just the key points? And um, actually, I'd just be interested to know what, when you were referring somebody to you two, what sort of, what just summarise the blood tests that you would like, men and women? So, and I think that the most common presentation I get or referral I get is change in menstrual cycles, stopping a contraceptive pill and no periods coming back or primary amenorrhea. And for that, I'd really like to see an amenorrheic workup with the prolactin, gonadotrophins, uh, estrogen, thyroid function tests, testosterone. Um, and then for men, clearly a testosterone rather than the estrogen. I would love you all to be out there talking to your athletic patients about the possibility of this condition and the, pos and the appropriateness of proper fueling. Dane actually has a lovely slide that he didn't show tonight entitled, Athletes Don't Diet and Exercise, They Fuel and Train. And I often quote that to my patients. I think it's really uh, powerful as a way to think about this look for this condition and have a very high level of suspicion, try to turn it around early. Okay, Dane, last word to you, sir. Um, yeah, I don't have any uh, blood tests or anything like that that's needed. Normally, just I just get referred from Megan and her workup that she requires. Um, but I, I think what we're missing is if athletes are fueling well and actually just following our fueling recommendations for mm. during exercise, recovery, meeting the carbohydrate requirements, they won't be energy deficient. So just making sure they make those changes based on their training, they'll will put them in a good steady situation. And if they are looking to change their dietary approach, and I think they need to do this with a professional, or if they need a well-structured weight loss, that's really important to do that with a nutrition professional. Okay, well, I'd just like to thank you two for a great talk. Um, when I was in medical school, I never came across this. So um, first time I came across it was seeing a talk by you, Megan. So thank you very much for your interest in this topic. And I think we will, we will take it to the streets. That's the challenge for us now. So um, thank you very much, both of you, for supporting the Good Fellow Unit. And thank the audience for participating and asking great questions. So good thank night, you, everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks, Bruce. Cheers.